Okay, good morning everyone. Today we'll be reading uh, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel 9 is um, the chapter regarding uh, Daniel's prayer, uh, which we'll see in a few minutes. And the last, what, four verses, um, 24 through 27, are the central passages on the Great Tribulation. That's his uh, prophecy that we've studied before and um, we'll hear about again this morning. So <clears throat> Daniel 9 starts off uh, verse 1. Um, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. This Darius, you can see on our chart, under the Persian uh, kings, there's a... Uh, Two Dariuses, Darius the Great and Darius the Second. Actually, our Darius in verse 9 is neither one of those. He's the first Darius. These two other guys are actually two and three. But um, this is the first year of the um, Persians' um, empire. Remember in chapter 5, the handwriting on the wall chapter was the last night of the Babylonians. And that's when they were having their drunken orgy. The handwriting on the wall came up. Um, <clears throat> and meanwhile, Cyrus the Great, along with Darius, his, one of his generals or co-kings, um, dammed up the Euphrates River so they could all walk down the creek bed or the river bed under the wall and conquer the city of Babylon. That was the end of the Babylonians and the beginning of the Persians' um, kingdoms. So this Darius is that guy from uh, chapter uh, 5. I'll read that verse. It's the last two verses of chapter 5. It says, That same night Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So that's who our Darius is here in, chapter, or in verse 1 of chapter 9. As we continue on with verse 2, it says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which uh, was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet. So what Daniel is doing here, remember this is now uh, almost the 70 years are up that the uh, Jews have been in captivity. This is the very end of those 70 years. He's reading from his scrolls, the scrolls he had of Jeremiah, and he's reading out of chapter 25 of Jeremiah. And I want to read, uh, I'll read those verses in a few minutes. I want to leave a little time for Jesse to preach, but I've got a lot of stuff to cover. So um, I've got uh, something I wanted to read about uh, that Jeremiah reading those, or excuse me, Daniel reading these verses. Um, it says Daniel probably um, was around 80 years old. He reports that he's reading Jeremiah. This is one of those rare places where in the Bible it talks, uh, it talks about someone reading some other portion of the Bible. Daniel had a scroll of Jeremiah, or at least a portion of it. Having unrolled the scroll, he reads through the, the Hebrew text, and comes across what we know as Jeremiah 25, 1 through 13. This is the passage in which Jeremiah confronts the fellow Judaites about their continued idolatry and declares specifically that God will send them into captivity under Nebuchadnezzar for 70 years, after which Babylon will be overthrown. Daniel begins to see um, his life on this parchment. It must have been a very moving experience because he realized that he was at the uh, tail end of the 70 year period. He could look back on decades of captivity with his people and he had recently watched Babylon come under the power of the Medes and the Persians. He could now know from this prophecy of Jeremiah that God was moving so he began to pray in earnest, uh, beginning here in verse 3. So verses 3 through 19 is Daniel's prayer. And in his prayer, he has 
the elements of confession and the elements of, um, um, uh, per, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, confession and, uh, well, he's praying for the other people. What's that called? Petition. Petition. There we go. Thank you. You want to come up and finish this for me? <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So he's doing that in this prayer. Uh, as we move on um, down to uh, verse 21, it mentions Gabriel. Verse 21 says, While I'm still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. So back in chapter 8, in verse 16, when Daniel had his vision of the ram and the goat, <clears throat> he didn't understand it, so he asked for help. And we have in verse 16 of chapter 8, Then I heard the voice of a man between the banks of the Ulael, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. So why is God using an angel, Gabriel, um, remember, there's only two other, well, there's only two angels in Scripture <coughs> that were named. There's a lot of angels, but these are the only two that had a name attached to them. That's Gabriel and Michael. God uses angels. He uses um, other things. Remember, the Holy Spirit was not a permanent gift in the Old Testament. So God communicated to people using angels. He also used his voice like he did with Moses. Um, he used um, other things like, uh, let's see if I have it down here. Um, I should have wrote it down. Um, visions. Ah, ooh, visions. Daniel has visions. So he uses other things, including, in this case, Gabriel, uh, the, one of the angels. Okay. What am I missing here? Um, <clears throat> oh, um, I wanted to read a couple of passages about Gabriel. I read you one out of verse uh, chapter 8. The other one I wanted to read is in Luke. In Luke chapter 1, <clears throat> this is the account of Zacharias and Elizabeth, who were the parents, or going to be the parents, of John the Baptist. And Zacharias isn't quite sure about all this, and he writes, in Luke, Luke writes, um, <clears throat> Zacharias said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. So Gabriel has shown up here a couple of times, and there he is again. As we get to verses 24 through 27, these, of course, are the central passages on the Great Tribulation. Uh, just a quick summary, we see in verse 24, it summarizes this prophecy uh, of the Great Tribulation. And <clears throat> I'm throwing up a picture here of a dispensational chart. Um, you can see the church age, which is where we are now. Um, the first 70 weeks of Daniel, 77s, the seven, uh, 70 weeks is 490 years. 483 years um, have already taken place now that we're in the church age. The church age pauses this 490 years, so there's seven more to go. So we have this parenthesis of the church. It'll start up again with the Great Tribulation. And on our chart here in the Great Tribulation, you can see it's cut in half, three and a half years and three and a half years. I'm going to comment on that in a second. But uh, verse 24 of Daniel 9 summarizes the prophecy of this. A great tribulation. Verse 25 gives us some information about the first 69 weeks or the 483 years. Verse 26 explains the parenthesis a little bit. And then verse uh, 27 gives us more information on the 70th seven, which is the uh, last seven years. Okay, and in this passage, uh, the verses 24 through 27, there are two people mentioned. One is the Messiah. And the other is um, the Antichrist. We saw a, a portrait or a picture of the Antichrist out of chapter um, 8, which was Antiochus Epiphany. He is the one who defiled the, the altar. He sacrificed on the altar a pig. He put an um, a idol of Zeus on there. And he persecuted the Jews. 
He's going to do that again. It won't be him. It'll be the Antichrist this time in the Great Tribulation. So the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation will be great persecution of the Jews um, with the Antichrist. He's going to break the treaty that they made, and he's going to start persecuting them um, through his actions. And again, a picture of Antiochus Epiphanes. I want to read out of Matthew 24, <clears throat> which is Christ's words about the Great Tribulation. And I'm reading, uh, starting at verse 15 of Matthew 24, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are missing, nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Okay, so we have that. That kind of sets us up for this. Um, I think I covered everything on my notes, even though they're a little backwards. But, um, okay, we're ready for Daniel chapter 9, and I'm beginning at verse 1. And did I have any other pictures to show you? Yeah. I'm just putting up the verses 24 through 27, but I'll be reading those aloud as we, as we get there. Okay, verse 1 of Daniel 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. So I gave my attention to the Lord to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame, as it is this day, to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away in all the countries to which you have driven them because of their unfaithful deeds which you have committed which they have committed against you. Open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong compassions and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Nor have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his teachings, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice, so the curse has been poured out on us, along with the oath which was written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. Thus he has confirmed his words, which he had spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us, to bring on us great calamity, for under the whole heaven there had not been done anything like what was done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God but by turning our iniquity, turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us, for the Lord our God is righteous, and with respect to all, 
his deeds which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, our God, who has brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as it is this day, we have sinned, we have been wicked. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. O oh my God, incline your ear and heart, or excuse me, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merit of our own, but on account of your great compassion. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and take action. For your own sake, O oh my God, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplication, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know the, and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. 